All right. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to episode four of Venturing in VC. You know, this is a live show where we speak to the most top and influential venture capitalists in the world to talk about their routines, journeys, and lessons. You can sign up for exciting guests every single Tuesday at inside.com slash VIVC. And as always, this episode will be going live on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube Thursday morning. So make sure to check that out as well. You know, so far for season one, we've had some awesome guests. We've heard from Turner Novak from Banana Capital, Marshall Sandman from Animal Capital, Wiz Abdullah from Space Cadet. And today is no different. We have a very special guest. We're going to be speaking with David Cowan, who is a partner at Bessemer Venture Partners. He's been a venture capitalist since 1992 and is known as one of the world's largest and leading investors across crowd infrastructure, cybersecurity, consumer, and space technology. David was also the first venture investor in tech's most beloved video game streaming platform, Twitch, which was later acquired by Amazon. Before we get in and invite him to the stage, I want to say thank you so much to our amazing sponsor for season one, Seed Invest. Seed Invest is the equity crowdfunding platform that helps entrepreneurs raise the capital they need from seed stage to series D by harnessing the awesome power of the crowd. You can learn more about how to get your business in front of their network of over 600 thousand investors at inside.seedinvest.com. All right, without further ado, let's welcome David. Hey, David, how's it going? Great. Hey, Landon. Nice to see you. And how's your Tuesday going so far? Uh, I, I, I can't complain. <laughs> really hoping that this is the highlight of the day. I'm just super excited to be able to talk about your journey, you know, advice for people who are interested in breaking into VC and overall, you know, your vision for Bessemer and what you see coming in the future. Sounds like fun. Sweet. All right. So we can start before your time in VC. Um, I understand that you started your career as a project manager at Oracle. Um, talk about this experience a little bit um, and some excitement that came from Oracle. Sure. Uh, so I studied computer science and math in college and uh, and it, it's it's is a long time ago, really before the whole tech industry took off. Uh, and um, I, I was, uh, I was recruited to, uh, to Oracle. I didn't, I hadn't even heard of Oracle. I didn't know what the company did. Uh, I went to this, um, interview on campus because my friends from the computer science department had kind of twisted my arm to go because they, a lot of them went to Oracle the year before. And, um, and, uh, I, and within, and so I interviewed with this guy named Larry Lynn, who was Larry Ellison's recruiter and Larry Lynn would go around and just collect computer science majors. Um, and he had kind of a quota to do it. So I think he didn't really care about any, what I said in the interview, he just needed to bring some numbers back to Larry Ellison. And so two minutes into the interview, even though I had, I didn't even know what Oracle did, he, uh, offered me a plane ticket to come to California and interview. And no one had ever offered me a plane ticket before. And I'd never been to California. So oh. I, I, I accepted and came out here and uh, got my first uh, exposure to the to the tech industry. So um, I, I, I still I was still quite skeptical about tech startups in general. And I and I and I, you know, thought I would be uh, and I still had this plan to go work in investment banking or consulting or some or some uh, much more um, glamorous industry as it was back then. Uh, but um, you know, Oracle sent me an offer the next day. I, I, uh, it, I, I kind of, I kind of threw it away, uh, in my dorm room and sort of ignored it. And then three weeks later, when I was interviewing with investment banks and, and I, and I came to understand more like what the life of a, an investment bank analyst is. Um, I remember going back to my dorm room and literally rummaging through a pile of laundry to, to dig out that offer from Oracle and, decided to um, to uh, come out to Silicon Valley and and see what all the excitement was about. Wow. And I love that that story began with your friend kind of dragging you there and motivating you to go. So, I mean, that's really cool. I mean, and those are sometimes the best opportunities that come, ones that you don't expect, you know, really high interest in, but, you know, ones that you kind of get pulled into. I want to talk about now how you broke into VC, because I understand that this is also a very, very interesting story. Um, and it's your story, so you're going to tell it, of course, but just to give the listeners kind of a sneak peek, 
I understand that you were told to visit 3000 Sand Hill Road, uh, where of course a lot of these venture capital firms, you know, are still located, but I mean, a lot of them back in the nineties, you know, were, and you went in with zero connections, literally, you know, you walked through the front door and asked for a summer position. I'd love for you to kind of elaborate at this time of how you really found out about venture capital and what motivated you to uh, knock on that front door. Yeah, so um, I had first heard the words venture capital from my dad. He 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 said, "Gee, you seem pretty entrepreneurial. Maybe one day you'll be interested in venture capital." And he told me what it was, and and I hadn't thought much about it after that. Um, when I was working at Oracle, there was this one room, one conference room that looked really nice, but we never used it. And I said, "How come we never use this conference room?" And somebody said, "Oh, that's for the board of directors. They don't like that's for." And I and I said, "Well." when did they meet? What do they meet about? And they said, well, you know, they're basically Larry's boss and they meet once a quarter or something. And, and, you know, to, to uh, talk to Larry about where we're going. Mm -hmm. And I thought that sounds like a pretty fun job. I remember my, I, oh, cause I, and I said, well, who are these directors? Who are these people? And someone said, well, they're mostly venture capitalists. And I thought, oh yeah, my, my dad told me about them. Um, and I, and I, and I, and I said, well, like, who are these venture capitalists? And, you know, and I'm thinking, how do I one day get to be one of them? Because it sounded like a really fun job. Um, and someone said, well, you know, they're all at 3000 Sand Hill Road, which was true back then. This is before there was a web. It was before there was a tech crunch. There was, I had no understanding at all of who VCs were, who the firms were, or anything like that. All I knew was this address. So, uh, you know, I got a paper map. And uh, got in my car and I drove there <laughs> and I parked my car and started walking around and looking at these names on the doors that I didn't know who they were. And then I just walked into one of the doors and said, hey, does this venture capital company uh, hire summer people? Because at that point I had I had applied to business school. I was going to go to business school and I thought maybe I'd work here for the summer. Mm -hmm. And um, and this very gracious receptionist said, no. And I said, well, do any of these venture capital companies hire summer people? And she said, yeah, I think so. And I said, which ones? And she pulled out a book called The Western Association of Venture Capital. And, um, and, and she circled five names on it and said, here, try them. I don't know how, like whether she really knew which firms were hiring summer people. Um, I, and, I, and I wish I remembered who she was because I'd go buy her a car now. Uh, <laughs> she like circled these five names. I went home. I wrote letters, not emails. I wrote letters um, and mailed them to these five firms. And uh, one of them was Best Firm Venture Partners, where um, I ultimately went to work out of business school as a result of that initial interview meeting that I got from my, my mail. And, um, and, uh, and I've been at Best Firm ever since. Well, first off, we need to find that receptionist. I hope she's streaming right now live because, um, yeah, that would be amazing to really track her down because, uh, you know, that one moment led to your uh, long standing career in the industry. So, wow, I mean, just really love that story. I know I read about it, but hearing you talk about it was really, really interesting. So thanks for sharing that with our audience, David. Um, and just looking back at the you know older days of venture capital compared to what it is today, um, I understand the industry. I mean, it's clear it operates very different. Um, when you started in venture capital, when you started with Bessemer, uh, if I'm familiar with this, I understand that you started uh, just covering the tech beat. Um, so you kind of just had all tech yeah. at your hands. And now, you know, it's very... That was my narrow specialty was tech because uh, Bessemer had an investor for retail. Mm -hmm. uh, Bessemer had an investor for financial, not fintech, just like banks. Um, we had an investor for biotech. Um, and uh, we had one other investor uh, who, was, who was my mentor who did kind of some retail and also did some communication technologies. But mm -hmm. all the rest of tech was, was uncovered. And, and I was brought in to like check out this kind of, you know, this, this area. Um, so, yeah, so, um, I started, I started, uh, the, the whole, in, the whole like industry, we didn't even call it an industry. It was like, I don't know what it was, but, um, <laughs> we didn't have the structure and the organizations and the data and all the stuff that we have today. Um, really it was more like, you know, just, just you, 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 you go around trying to find startups, um, which there weren't, you know, that many. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you take a, you take a pitch meeting and, um, and decide whether to do due diligence. 
And initially, every pitch meeting that I took, I just thought, wow, this is incredible. This is so amazing. And, um, and I escalated many of them to the partnership. Um, and I did that a few times, at which point my mentor, Felda Hardiman, pulled me aside and said, you know, these deals you're bringing us, they're really bad. They're just really bad deals. You're just, you're just not bringing us good opportunities. Why don't you go off and do a little bit of sort of research into what it is you want to invest in? Mm -hmm. And that, um, and that led me to what we at Bessemer now refer to as, as road mapping, um, where before we meet with companies, we do some fundamental research into where we see the world changing. And, uh, and we create a proactive plan for going out and finding the startups that we want to invest in because they, they fit our perspective on where the world is going. And so I spent three months just kind of literally traveling around, meeting with you know the smartest people I could find. I met with Al Lil, who was a Gartner Group uh, analyst. Um, I met with uh, Rick Sherland, who was the who was the the best known equ tech equities analyst. He was at Goldman Sachs. I met with Eric Schmidt, who at the time was uh, the CTO of Sun Microsystems, um, and I just you know went and asked these people all about the different areas of tech and which ones they were excited about and why. And I whittled down this list of about 39 different technology areas into five and decided I was going to go find startups within those five areas. Um, uh, you know, one of those areas, for example, was wavelength division multiplexing, where you put multiple wavelengths of light over the same fiber. And that led me to invest in Siena. Um, uh, one area was, uh, was security, which no venture investor had invested in at the time. It was considered, you know, like a, a dead end. Um, but this weird thing called the internet was coming. And I thought maybe now that multiple parties were sharing the same networks, there might have to be some rules um, around that. Um, there was the internet itself, which, you know, my colleagues at Bessemer hadn't even heard of. And I had to explain to them what this ARPANET thing was. Um, which led me to invest in the first venture-backed ISP called uh, PSINet, um, hmm. and so e each of these, you know, each of these five technologies motivated me to go out and find entrepreneurs who were who were going after these things, and um, that turned out to be a much more pr productive, fruitful uh, way of investing. That's wonderful advice, you know, for capital allocators that are looking to start out right now. I mean, there's a lot of excitement from so many different industries. We can say now, um, you know, a lot of deal flow coming in, but I love how you, you know, redefined your approach, got much more specific. Um, and then that really helped, you know, um, you manage the deal flow and make better deals. So that's really, really cool to hear about. Um, is there anything else, you know, we spoke about due diligence then versus now, um, you know, covering beats then versus now. Is there anything else that's like really, really different? from, you know, when you started venture investing uh, back in the 90s compared to how it is today? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what, when people talk about venture capital today, we're, we're mostly talking about a very different asset class even than what venture capital was when I joined. Uh, and what I mean is that when I, when I joined and I became a VC, the challenge was to try to figure out which of these companies were going to survive, which of them were going to build real businesses. And, um, and it, it was hard to know. Uh, what happened after the dot-com burst and the, and the arrival of the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, regulations is that companies who, is that the time frame for companies to go public changed. Um, it used to be that tech companies would go public when they had $20 million of sales. Um, today, you can't really go public until you've got $100 million of recurring revenue. And like $100 million of recurring revenue, you could argue is something more like, you know, four or $500 million of sales uh, in the old way of thinking. Um, companies to go public today, you really need to be much, much further along. And what that means is that all these tech companies in order to get to that point, need funding. Mm -hmm. And and the funding that you go from, the funding that takes you from 20 million to 100 million is a lot more than the funding that gets you to 20. And so most of the dollars that go into startups today are going into these 
growth expansion companies. Um, and, you know, uh, there's a pretty clear w distinction in my mind between early stage and late stage venture. And it has to do with product market fit. When you have a, when you already have a product in the market where that people love and they say, you can't take this away from me. And you've climbed the sales learning curve so that you've got good metrics, usually SaaS metrics on recurring revenue. You're now, you're now a, what I would call a late stage venture deal. Um, and, and it's a very, very different kind of investment because the, the trick is not to figure out whether the company is a good company and it's going to survive. You know it's a good company and it's going to survive. Um, the trick is to now really win the deal by, by convincing this company that you and your firm are the best partner they could have to, in, to optimize their, their growth and their future. And, and so it's, it has less to do with kind of fundamental research into the field and it has more to do with, with services that you can provide as a partner in that company. And so, um, and so if you look at most of venture capital, it kind of looks more like investment banking almost than, than the, than the, um, you know, analytical research oriented activities of the early stage investors. Um, and so, you know, when people talk about VC, I think there's just, there's a lot of differences between that early stage motion and the late stage motion in terms of what's hard about it and what, what you need to do well. Um, for, you know, for me, I love the early stage stuff. I mm -hmm. love trying to figure out where the world is going. It's, it's really, it's hard and humbling because I'm, I'm often wrong. Um, but it's just so challenging and interesting and it forces me to learn new things, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I learned about space and drones and quantum computing and, and uh, now nuclear fission and fusion, and I'm 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 constantly trying to to learn these new areas, which which I love doing. Um, but but this is very different than what kind of most VCs do, if you look at it in terms of the dollars. Um, so yeah, two two very different kinds of even asset classes. I love hearing about the excitement that early stage brings you. And, um, you know, it's something that we've heard from a lot of our speakers, because of course, I mean, you know, you got to be a little more risky and like look um, into the future because you know, no one obviously knows exactly what's going to happen, but I'm just very in awe that you're willing to take these big bets and you have been, and a lot of them have of course paid off. I think this is a perfect opportunity to dive into, uh, you know, your portfolio and just looking at it by numbers of your investments, 24 uh, companies that you've invested in um, have gone on to IPO. Um, on that uh, 34, 34 now, 35, <laughs> yeah. it's old. which is only amazing. More, <laughs> um, well, so yeah. 34, this say. year was a big year because of the whole SPAC wave, of, so, course, uh, of course. Another, another four this year. Yeah. We'll make sure to highlight that one more time. 34 companies have gone on to IPO. Um, of you know, the companies that you have invested in, you know, we can name some of them here LinkedIn, Twitch, Zapier, uh, Twilio. Um, I would love to, you know, dive into this a little more. And just understand, um, how have you gotten so lucky? Um, that's, that is a, that, that's actually, that's a really good question. That's the right way to frame it. Um, for, for one thing, a lot of it is luck. Uh, I, I entered the industry in 1992 as a tech investor going into, you know, the dot-com wave. So, uh, be, you know, being given a checkbook to go make tech investments leading into the dot-com you know, uh, uh, wave of IPOs that that's luck. That's like, that's, that's good luck. Um, and, uh, and in venture, there is some degree of, you know, what people have called the halo effect, where once you have some success, it kind of gets easier to, to, to make more investments. Um, by the way, I'll just say the halo effect is real in some ways. You, 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 you learn to be a better director. It's easier to raise money to, to make more investments. Um, people want you in their deals, uh, but it never gets easy figuring out what the next big thing is and which company is going to be successful. Mm -hmm. There's no halo effect there. Um, uh, you know, uh, in fact, if anything, there's a, there's a drain, there's a, there's, there's the opposite because as people, as venture investors build a portfolio, 
we spend most of our time going to board meetings, um, managing our portfolios and the, and the administration of the firms that we work in. And there's much less time for doing that kind of fundamental research that, that I, you know, nostalgically remember and tell you about in that, you know, three month journey, um, that I did. And so, uh, and so, you know, I, I really believe that, that, um, young new investors in a way have an advantage in terms of, in terms of just trying to figure out, you know, where the world is going. Um, but, uh, but I missed, I, I lost track of your question now. Which was- um, well, I mean, I think you pretty much answered that. That was a wonderful, beautifully put answer as well. Um, and I think there's a second uh, follow up here um, that we're getting from the audience as well. I mean, just, you know, with so much information at our disposal, talking about young people, you know, capital allocators, we're looking to get into this and do it well. Um, you know, how, how should we be separating information and like, how can we really take in the best information to make better decisions on the companies that we want to invest in? So um, I think I think that that whatever it is that you invest in, you need to try to develop some proprietary view or insight into it. Um, and and there there are a couple there are different ways of doing that. Um, one way is to really become a specialist in some new area, like to decide I'm going to figure out quantum computing and I'm going to like figure out who the winners there are and I'm going to make some bets there. Um, and you know, I, I mentioned quantum computing because right now that's kind of, that's, that's an interesting area that's difficult to understand. And if you, you, you have to really invest a lot of time to, to understand what it's about. Um, so, uh, but there's, there are many, many areas like that, many, many different areas across crypto and, and agriculture and all kinds of different interesting areas, biotech, all kinds of areas. So one way is to really, really dive into one area. Another one is to, um, is to really uh, focus your dollars on people whom you know that, you, that just impress the hell out of you. Um, and, you know, this is something that I, I learned the hard way. And what I mean is that I didn't do that early on. Early on, I kind of thought, I'm not going to invest in my friends because that seems like that seems lazy and that seems delusional to think that my friends are the ones who are going to change the world. I was wrong. OK, I like I, I lost. I, you know, I, 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 I gave up really, really juicy opportunities because I, I actually, you know, I actually, de- you know, weighted the wrong way, negatively weighted. Um, ventures that were started by people I knew. Um, another thing to do is to attach yourself to a community that uh, you think is going to be able to generate innovative ventures that's not really well funded by, you know, lots of VCs out there. So, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you, um, oh, so that could be, for example, a particular university that's not well uh, resourced or a geography, a remote geography where you might have lots of engineers or scientists or something, but not a lot of capital sources. Um, like finding you know, opportunities like that. So that's like one way of thinking about how to, how to build a niche. I mean, for me, the niche was technology. Obviously that's not a niche anymore, but you know, there, there, there are many, many interesting niches out there. Great lessons, David. Um, you know, of course, the first one, as you said, finding an industry or something you can really obsess over. Um, your third point, you know, and finding a community and that middle point that you made, which is a perfect transition, because we're going to dive into a lot of those opportunities um, that you did miss out on. Um, I was on your website yesterday, um, Bessemer, um, BBP. Dot com and I came across your anti-portfolio. Um, this is a awesome list. I really uh, recommend everybody who's streaming um, check it out. We're going to stream it to the interview. Um, let me give some more context. You know, a lot of times we're, we're very quick to highlight our accomplishments, the amazing things that we've done, great companies that we've invested in. Bessemer has this area of their comp- um, what company's website where they show the mistakes in companies that they missed out on investing, opportunities where they had um, chances to invest in. Um, and I know that there are a lot of companies on this list. You know, Coinbase, I saw Google, Airbnb. Um, David, if I 
recognize correctly as well, you almost said no to Twitch, uh, which was then acquired by Amazon. You did invest in that one. But I'd love to kind of talk about this philosophy. What led to the creation of the anti-portfolio? And is this sort of a model that more capital allocators should follow, you know, not just always highlighting the, uh, the accomplishments, but more or less also talking about the mistakes. So a real, I would say just a, an, maybe the most fundamental core value at Bessemer is, is, uh, in, intellectual honesty and a, and a growth mindset. Um, we, we, want our entrepreneurs to have it. Um, the first idea that an entrepreneur has is never exactly the right idea. Mm -hmm. um, you always have to zig and zag as you, as you build your product and find the right market and, and decide what you're going to do. Um, and in order to, in order to just make good decisions all along the way, you need to, you need to have the humility of knowing that you, that you make mistakes and and learning from them um the, we wrote the the anti portfolio in 1999 when like honestly I, I i was kind of embarrassed by the venture industry who had this posture of being masters of the universe that we can do no wrong and if you work with us like we'll we'll make you successful um and we wanted entrepreneurs to know that we don't think that's the way the world works. We think people make mistakes and that what you really want to do is to be able to own them and not feel, you know, not, not judge each other on our mistakes, but to learn from them. And so we decided to set an example by, you know, sharing our mistakes. Initially, my idea was to, um, share the companies that we invested in that failed and say, to, cause like, you know, to say, look, look at our mistakes. Mm -hmm. But, um, but but the 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 other people involved, the entrepreneurs and the co-investors, were not always as as uh, they didn't always have the same sense of humor about it as we did, if you will. Like they were, they, <laughs> they didn't want to be kind of outed as being failures. Mm -hmm. um, and so we so we switched to this other mistake, which in retrospect actually is is a much more important mistake to make. Like you know, to lose our money in a bad investment, you know, only costs us that investment, but to not invest in Google or Airbnb is a much more costly mistake. And so it actually makes sense that we, we focus on that mistake. And, and it, it does a few things. For one thing, it conveys our core value of, mm -hmm. of growth mindset. Like I said, it leads the way for entrepreneurs, but it's also a good reminder for us at Bessemer because we read the anti-portfolio often and we talk about, <laughs> it forces us to think about what did we do wrong? What did we miss? What should we, you know, hopefully do better the next time we're assessing an opportunity? And, you know, it, it's really caused us to change the conversation in our investment discussions. Instead of asking what can go wrong with an investment, now we ask what can go right with an investment? Mm. And how can, like, how can, let's, let's have a conversation to figure out how big could this be? And, and that's now really the more important part of the conversation about new investments. I love that. Reflection is key in anything you do. It doesn't have to be venture investing. I just love and became obsessed with this area of your website and really recommend everybody check it out. Reading some of these stories, I was just like, wow, I love how open and honest and transparent they are. Um, and really, thank you for breaking that down. I don't want to speak too long um, on this one, of course, because we're going to move on to talk about, um, you know, your advice for founders. But um, do you want to elaborate on the Google story a little bit? Um, I know it's on the website. People can check it out. But um, I thought that the at least the story was one of the most interesting ones on the um, anti-portfolio. So the Google story is an example of of my of my um, of my skepticism about backing friends because uh, Susan Wojcicki, who whom you know you know is the CEO of YouTube, yeah. um, she and I were she and I are close friends and we've been close friends since college. But um, she had rented her garage to to uh, some students for a startup. And she said, oh, you should meet these guys. They seem really smart. And I thought, oh my God, like uh, another startup. I, I, you know, I, I don't want to, like, I don't want to get deal flow from my friends or family or, you know, because it's probably not going to be good deal flow. And that was, that was hubris. Um, 
that you know that now haunts me on the web forever. Um, uh, because I, and I and I said to her, well, you know, what are they doing? And she said, well, they're making a, a search engine. Oh, you mean like Alta Vista and Yahoo and Northern Lights and all the other search engines out there? Well, yeah, I guess. Uh, well, who are these people? Well, they're two students from Stanford. And then I said, well, Susan, can, can I get out of your, how do I get out of your house without going through your garage? Because like, I don't want to run into these guys. And that was just like the most, you know, arrogant. Uh, that was the best example of arrogance, uh, you know, that perhaps I can, I can remember in my life. Uh, and obviously was a, was a costly one. Of course. I mean, reason to be skeptical. I mean, uh, you know, how you just defined that made sense, but I mean, you know, we're not always going to get everything right. And, uh, at least, I mean, you were able to learn from it and then go on and do amazing things after and invest in some really, really great founders, which we spoke, with that, spoke about that portfolio. Um, so, David, thank you so much for sharing information on that. So um, let's transition a little bit. Um, through Bessemer, um, you guys have incubated you know, a lot of companies and you had opportunities to serve as a co-founder to three cybersecurity companies. Uh, just VeriSign, you served as the initial chairman and CFO, Good Technology. Um, that was acquired by BlackBerry and who served as a CEO And defense.net was acquired by F5. Um, you know, I'm curious, like, what did you learn during this journey as being co-founder for three different companies? Yeah. So, um, I had mentioned earlier how I had mapped out areas of technology and I said, I'm going to go out and find startups that are doing those things. And, <clears throat> you know, uh, back then, like I said, there weren't as many startups. And so sometimes I'd identify some area and nobody was doing it. And so, um, and so I would decide, you know, if nobody's doing it, then I'm going to start a company to do it. And, you know, from day one, I'll have Bessemer to fund it and we'll go off and hire a team and we'll, we'll build a company. Um, and so, uh, those three examples were all examples where it worked really well. There are other examples where I tried it, it didn't work so well. Um, but the, uh, but VeriSign is probably the best example. Um, and uh, and, and, you know, you probably don't remember this, but back in 1995, 94, uh, the web emerged, but there, but people were not comfortable putting their credit card numbers into a web session. Mm -hmm. And so there really wasn't any commerce on the web. And, um, and, uh, there's a, there's a professor, Ron Rivest, he's the R in RSA who, uh, at a poker game explained to me how you could use public key cryptography in order to create certificates that authenticate strangers on the internet. And, um, and that seemed really interesting to me. Um, I actually, uh, I actually visited, I'd been, I'd been talking to RSA, which was this little company in Foster city had no venture capital, uh, about, you know, could Bessemer fund them and we would start a certificate authority in order to, in order to, um, authenticate people on the internet. And, um, and, uh, but the time RSA was 51% owned by a billionaire named Addison Fisher, who, who lived, maybe still lives in the Everglades of Florida. So, uh, I flew out to Florida and drove out to the Everglades and he was working in this, like this tin, like corrugated roof, tin shack in the middle of the Everglades. Like I, I it's, I mean, it, it was pretty weird. And, uh, and I went there and said, Hey, I, I want to invest in this company RSA. And he said, well, you know, you can, it, it's too valuable because we have all these patents on public key cryptography. You know, I'm not going to let you invest unless you invest at a valuation of 20 million pre, which was just like crazy back then, 20 million pre for a startup. That was nuts. <laughs> so, um, so I left and then, um, at another poker game with Jim Bidzos, the CEO, uh, we concocted this idea of creating a new co, um, and the new co would, would, um, would then pursue this, uh, and give equity to RSA. And so I created very, I created digital certificates international is what I called it. I did a deal with RSA where I gave them a third of the company in exchange for all the technology. Um, and so, and so Addison Fisher and his company still held all the IP. They didn't give us any IP. And we just became a, a, a company to operate a certificate authority. We gave 1% of the company to Netscape and they put our public key into the browser, the most, into the Netscape browser. 
And then um, that enabled the little lock on the on the browser that says you're now in an encrypted session, an SSL session. So all of that was enabled by VeriSign. And today it's still the infrastructure that allows us to have encrypted web sessions. So um, so, uh, so that was my first uh, uh, founding experience. Um, right away, Jim Bidzos came in and started running it, which was great. Um, at Good Technology, um, I, was at a, I was at a Network World conference and I, and I thought, oh, there's all these computers here. This was in 1996, and I sure wish I can get access to my email and calendar through one of these computers on the internet. And so I thought well, there needs to be some way that through the internet you can get access to your stuff. And so um, I started this company at the time we called it, it was Visto. Later we, we acquired Good Technology, or actually won it in an IP lawsuit um, and changed the name to Good. Um, wow. and, I, and, I, and I ran the company for about a year and, and I learned that I'm not a good CEO and I don't want to be a CEO. I don't, I, and it's something, it actually gave me a real appreciation for the job that founders do um, when they start companies because, um, because it, 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 I, I found it, I, 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 I it, it was, it was emotionally difficult for me to recruit people away from good paying jobs and move themselves and their families to like go join this thing, which was very risky. And every decision that I was making was, you know, was jeopardizing the livelihood of these people whom I'd recruited. Um, and I found it to be a very stressful uh, job myself. And, and I came away from it with a, with a real appreciation for the founders who do it. Um, I, I then uh, hired in a CEO who came in and, and ran the company from there. And then in F5, um, right away, I, I, uh, I teamed up with a founder uh, who's brilliant, Barrett Lyons. He had this kind of crazy idea about a new generation of DDoS protection. And, um, and I said, great, let's start a company and, and uh, called my friend Chris Risley, who's a very experienced serial uh, CEO, and um, we started the company in Bessemer's offices, hit the ground running, and, and sold it to F5 18 months later. Wow, that's amazing, though. I mean, it's really cool just seeing that you're able to give founders wonderful advice because, you know, you've done the journey yourself, and um, there are parts of it that you love, parts of it that you didn't love, and I think that that's always something that I'm trying to tell my peers, like, don't just do, do things that you love. You got to do things that you don't necessarily like, too, to see what you like and what you don't like, so it's really important in trying to get yourself, um, you know, figured out and within any um, you look to um, get involved with. Yeah, um, so we're going to have a five-minute favorite section. This is going to be our speed round where I'm going to ask you a few questions. Um, okay. You just give, you know, the first answer that comes to mind. But before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about Bubble Proof. Um, this is an award-winning Silicon Valley satire TV show with modest data harvesting. That's what it's coined online. This is a TV show that you star in and also help develop. Would love to share with our audience a little information about Bubble Proof. Right, so Bubble Proof is a is a mockumentary. Uh, uh, it's a it's a ten episode series available at bubbleproof.tv. Um, it's the brainchild of Michael Furtick, who was the founder of Reputation, uh, and and I met Michael at a pitch meeting when he pitched me on on Reputation, and I ended up uh, investing in Reputation, um, mm -hmm. which uh, which um, by the way announced this morning. That it crossed 100 million in ARR and raised a 150 wow. million dollar growth round. Congratulations! That's awesome. Uh, but uh, so I met Michael through that. Um, Michael is is a uh, is a an, an irrepressibly creative person. Um, brilliant legal mind, entrepreneur, playwright, poet, uh, author. He's he's written, you know, best selling nonfiction and fiction. Um, really, really, a, a, a you know, a, a visionary. Um, and, um, and when he was running reputation, he, uh, he thought it would be a good idea to create a, a kind of a satire, um, in order to help, in order to help recruit engineers, uh, to make reputation seem like a fun, cool place to be. And so he created a movie, um, called Femto, um, actually, and he invited me to have a cameo in it and some other VCs. 
uh, playing ourselves, uh, you know, like caricatures of ourselves. And um, and actually, the film did very well in festivals. And he made a follow on movie, CI. And then one day we were talking about um, and, and, and these movies were about Michael Furtick playing himself, playing this visionary whom people in Silicon Valley follow, you know, out of out of out of FOMO, out of like you 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 see someone who seems to be saying sort of brilliant things, even though it may not actually make sense to you, but you kind of brush it off as being something maybe just I don't fully understand. But other people seem to think this person's really smart. Right. So this kind of Elizabeth Holmes, <laughs> Elizabeth Holmes type of visionary. Yeah. Right. And so Michael plays this this visionary um, and then in these films and it's he's he's brilliant. And then we and then one day Michael and I were talking about like what's next for this character, Michael Furtick. And we decide, of course, Michael needs to become a venture capitalist. Mm -hmm. And um, and so he needs a, a mentor in VC. And so. Uh, Michael and I set off to create this series called Bubble Proof, which is about the this journey of Michael and David creating a um, a, a modern venture fund um, around around Michael's genius. And the reason that you can say, you know, like the reason I did it, one, it was super fun to do. Hopefully, if you watch it, you'll think it's you'll think it's funny too. Um, but it also goes to this idea about uh, humility and a growth mindset, um, and and what happens when you suspend critical thinking? What happens when you have such a fear of missing out, like we have in Silicon Valley, that you decide you need to jump on some momentum startup uh, that maybe doesn't really make sense, but other people seem to think it's it's going well. Um, and 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 so uh, we thought that was sort of a a pathology of Silicon Valley that was worth mocking especially on the heels of the Trump uh, victory, um, because uh, at least for some people, you know, there, there's no better uh, example of suspension of critical thinking than that election. Um, and so it, and, and so we kind of, the, it, that's all kind of wrapped up in the, in the, in the mockumentary as well. Yeah. Um, I had an opportunity to watch the trailer. It was uh, hilarious. And I uh, just wanted to really like give you some time to talk about it because uh, it's just cool seeing all the amazing things that you've been a part of. I mean, you're an actor, um, venture capitalist, and of course we can talk about your acapella career as well uh, towards the end, but uh, it just seems that you love to stay busy. So that's really, really cool. Um, so David, we're going to dive right into the speed round again, you know, don't think too much about these answers. Um, first thing that comes to mind. And uh, after the speed round, we'll do a quick audience q and I've been managing looking at all, all these questions coming in from the audience. Really appreciate it. If you guys have more questions for David that you want us to touch on at the end, feel free to ask in the chat and we will get to those. Um, all right. First question for the speed round. What is your favorite book? My favorite book would be The Mind's Eye by Douglas Hofstadter. Love that. Favorite podcast? You can you can skip three, by the way. <laughs> um, my favorite podcast would be uh, my partner Steve Krause's podcast. Mm. Uh, what's it called? Um, I don't remember the name of it. That's okay. why I'm, <laughs> well, why we'll I'm hesitant, it. but I I I listen to it. Of I course. recommend it. We'll link it on Thursday. Um, okay. Favorite company, and it can be a company within your portfolio, of course. Rocket Lab. Mm. And what does Rocket Lab do? We. Uh, we deliver satellites to orbit. Uh, we've had 23 successful missions. The 24th is scheduled for February 4th. Um, we've delivered over 100 satellites to low Earth orbit, and our current manifest includes missions to the Moon, Venus, and Mars. Wow, that's amazing. A rocket lab is what it's called. That's yes. super cool. Uh, favorite city to visit in the US? New York, because I am a Broadway musical nut. Mm. Favorite music? I mean, we can add this one. What's your favorite uh, musical? Book of Mormon. Book of Mormon. That's a really, really good one. Yeah. Uh, favorite food? I have a crazy story. Oh, let's like... pause the food to get into the story real quick. <laughs> so last week was my birthday, and my family knows I'm crazy about musicals, but I haven't been able to go to New York because of COVID. And also the theater teams, they're all out of work. They don't have work, right? Because mm -hmm. they're, which is, which is a hardship. Um, and so they, they, um, 
for my birthday, they brought the touring Broadway cast of Book of Mormon to my home to perform okay. here. And, and, and in my living room, we had a performance of Book of Mormon, which was fabulous. That is so cool. Yeah. So, so cool. Wow. I mean, that must have been an amazing birthday gift and happy belated, by the way. And yeah, I saw Book of Mormon in high school in San Francisco and it's a, it's a great production. I can only imagine seeing that in my house though. <laughs> That'll be really cool. Um, all right. So we'll go to favorite food. Ah, so many. Um, I, let's see. Uh, Feel free to use one of your skips if you need to. I, I, no, no, there's just, I, I'm just like too many foods <laughs> popping in my head. Um, I think um, I would say, uh, I would say blackened trout. Wow. Okay. L love that choice. That's a really good very one. Very specific. Yeah, very specific. Um, okay. Favorite piece of technology. I, I think you've covered this a few times um, during today's discussion, but I mean, if there's just one, we can, uh, we can get that answered. Um. I, uh, I, I have to say that I really, um, I really enjoy, uh, I really enjoy my Tesla cars. Are you getting the Cybertruck? No. Considering it? No. <laughs> I think it's going to be very exciting. Um, so I'll be looking into that. Okay. Now, I mean, these last two questions, um, feel free to take all the time you need to answer, but favorite childhood memory. That's why we call it five minute favorites because we saved the last three minutes for these last mm. two questions. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I, I, at the risk of making it sound like I didn't have a, a memorable childhood, I had a wonderful childhood and I'm, and I'm for which I'm, you know, super grateful. Um, it's difficult to pinpoint one now for sure. I, have to, I mean, I mean, this is going to sound weird, but probably like math camp, hmm. math camp was really, was really, was really fun. I love that. That's a good answer. I just, I, I just, the people I met, the, uh, the, it was, it was in this rustic campus on Hampshire college and, and, um, probably that's one of my, uh, yeah, I really remember that fondly. Love that. Um, and the last one, favorite piece of advice, this can be one that you've gotten from others or one that you give to others, a favorite piece of advice. Um, it's a, it probably, if I can remember the line, it, there's a, there's a song by Tim Minchin. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, uh, it's probably, it's my favorite song. You didn't ask me my favorite song. If you did, I would tell you my favorite song is white wine in the sun. And, um, and in that song, he says, um, I don't believe that just because ideas are tenacious, it means that they're worthy. And, um, and that is a, that is a challenge to all of us to really scrutinize what we've been told, what we've been told by friends, teachers, clergy, parents, the media, authority figures, governments, what are we told? And do, do those do those assertions fit the evidence? Um, so think and live scientifically. That's my advice. And don't, and the fact that, that other people may think that something is true, they may, they're, they're, um, don't, don't, 
you know, don't accept it on the face of that. Faith is not evidence. And, um, and faith is not consistent. People have faith in all different kinds of things and deities and ideas. Um, so um, think and live scientifically. David, that's very powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that on this show. Really, really appreciate that. Um, okay, so with that, we can pivot to audience Q&A, uh, dive into a few of these. But overall, this has been a wonderful conversation, David. Really appreciate this. Yeah. Um, all right, first question we have. Does David slash Bessemer fear hardware part, uh, parts in healthcare tech, or sorry, health tech startups on seed stage? So... Uh, there are definitely a lot of investors who just shy away from hardware. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would I would tell you that I'm I, I think that that um, some of the most interesting and important companies today uh, are hardware companies. I mentioned you know Tesla cars, Rocket Lab, quantum computer companies um, that probably you know it. it you know, I, I'm sure I'm going to probably provoke a lot of people when I say software is easy, hardware is hard. And that's why that's why funding hardware is important and potentially very profitable. Um, now, in terms of health tech, I can't imagine a more important sector than health tech, uh, but um, I am not a, a health tech investor um, for the most part. Um, so uh, for me, it's not a matter of fear. It's a matter of knowing my limitations. And if somebody came to me with a great health tech startup, whether software or hardware, I would call my partners, Andrew Heading and Steven Krauss and ask them to assess it. Know your limitations. Love that. That's a clip right there and a very good quote. Uh, that's probably advice that I would give to people as well. We want to handle and take on way too much sometimes in life, but it's good that you know. I mean, you know, this is what I specialize in and this is what I have to get someone else involved in. Um, a question from Ian, does David slash Bessemer invest in startups, uh, pre-seed, seed, et cetera? So what stage? And if so, is security, cybersecurity now still an area of interest? Ah, okay. It sounds like Ian has a really good cybersecurity startup brewing. Um, here and, too. Uh, and the answer is that I do invest in pre-seed, seed, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, as I mentioned, sometimes I even involved in, in the formation stage. Uh, but Twilio, for example, was a seed investment. Um, and, and so, you know, that one worked out pretty well. So yeah, I do, I do make seed investments and cybersecurity is still, is still very, very much an interest. Um, it's especially the more, what I would call the thornier parts of cybersecurity, um, like industrial cybersecurity, um, which, which, uh, you know, still stymie a, a, a lot of people in the industry. Right. Okay. Question from Pran Shu. Um, there's a cybersecurity startup here in India. Great to hear that we have a listener in India also um, that has come up with a way to do quantum RNG. How would you go about double verifying a complex B model as entropy, um, entropy as a service? Okay. Um, how would I double verify entropy as a service model? Um, so certainly, I mean, that is a, that would require a depth of knowledge that I don't have, but I would go, you know, find some smart folks out there, either maybe at Rigetti or Xanadu or some quantum company um, to help me do it. But I would start by expressing some skepticism about entropy as a service as a large enough market to um to invest in and i'm not saying it's not but i am not convinced yet that it is um so uh maybe your startup will end up on my anti-portfolio one day um <laughs> but i'm I, I i i but uh random number generation is not currently on my on my roadmap thanks for answering that one and the last one we have another one from ian uh, David says investments are all about where the world is going and not where the world could be going. Also a sound strategy, even though far fewer companies choose a divergent approach. Um, if you could speak on that, I believe is the part of the question. <clears throat> uh, 
So that's a very fair uh, critique. Um, I think you're. I think you're right that um, that it's look all, almost all investment is about where the world is going. The really, really killer companies um, change the narrative and say and say and they do something that if they didn't do it, nobody else would. That is the mark of like a really amazing disruptive startup. I try to do that as an investor. I try to invest in companies that aren't going to get funded if I don't do them, right? Which is kind of weird. It's like, okay, then I'm looking at companies that must be not very good, right? If nobody else would fund them. Um, but that's kind of what I'm looking for because to me, that's 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 what makes my job important um, is when I feel like I'm I'm contributing by helping create something that wouldn't happen without me. Um, and so... Uh, uh, and, and if you take that to the, to the next level, then you would say, yeah, we, I want to make a company that's going to do something that if we don't do it, no one else is going to do it. And that's really, that is really exciting. Powerful principle. We'll take one more. Um, do you have any advice when it comes to negotiating difficult deals? Um, it depends on the deal, of course. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, my advice is to find out what the other person wants and give it to them. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like it sounds <laughs> silly, but, um, but, uh, I, I, I don't, I, I don't think I don't tr I don't think it's a good idea to try to make money by like tricking someone in through negotiation. Of course. Um, I, I think it's a really good idea to be very explicit about what's important to the other side, what's important to you and to, um, and to, uh, and, and try to do a fair deal rather than trying to do a, a, like a shrewd deal. Um, I mean, one thing when I negotiate term sheets, for example, I'm very clear with the entrepreneur that what I care about is equity ownership. That's what I care about. If you're gonna like, I want to have a significant equity stake in your business. And if you want like these 10 other terms to be edited by your lawyer, that's fine. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm just, I, I try to keep it very simple, be very clear about what I want and, and try to be accommodating. And if somebody, you know, and if, and I'm not always going to get all the equity ownership that I want in a deal because, because uh, it's it's dilutive to the entrepreneur. But um, but hopefully I can, you know, prevail upon the entrepreneur to part with a little bit more equity um, in order to get me involved. And so, you know, in addition to doing due diligence on teams, I also help entrepreneurs do do, do due diligence on me and my partners. And I show up with my own data room. They have a data room and I have a data room. And I say, here, call these folks and ask them what it's like working with me. And I'm, you know, I don't call them first. I they just like, here's everybody I've ever worked with. Feel free to like reach out. If they don't respond to you, that's a bad signal, right? So um, go to town. And um, that's my advice on negotiating. <laughs> Wonderful advice. Overall, be transparent <laughs> from, from the get-go. So I really appreciate that. Um, now, this isn't a question, but someone just saying that they hope that this interview is being recorded. It is, and it will be going live Thursday morning on our Spotify, Apple, and YouTube um, distribution platforms. Overall, David, I just want to say this conversation was a 10 out of 10. Really appreciate you. I know how busy you are with your schedule and got to be there for a lot of founders, but you made an hour of your day uh, for us, Venturing VC and Inside.com, shared some amazing advice, um, just really walked us through your principles for investing and overall what we can expect in the future. So just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, this was fun. Thank you, Landon. Of course, of course. And um, as you know, everybody knows, we have episodes every single Tuesday. We're going to be speaking with someone special from SoftBank next week. Um, as I mentioned, the podcast will be live Thursday morning. And one more time, thank you so much to Seed Invest, our sponsor for season one. You can learn more about how to get your business in front of their network of over 600,000 investors at inside.seedinvest.com. All right, everybody, enjoy the rest of your week. <laughs>